Well, Dr. Stephanie Kelton, welcome to the Climate Pod. Thank you so much for having me. Well, after reading the deficit myth, I, I am confident that if America is going to really take the steps to address the climate crisis at the scale and at the speed necessary, then our policymakers must understand the core tenets of modern monetary theory and really disregard their flawed and antiquated views on America's debt and deficit. So in order to understand the climate implications of all of this, I really want to first help the audience understand MMT. So if you could just summarize at a pretty high level, the core principles of modern monetary theory. Okay, sure. So what MMT is about is giving a, an explanation of how a sovereign currency works. Okay, now you say, all right, well, what's a sovereign currency, right? So what we're talking about are um, the policy options, let's say, that are available to countries that have a sovereign currency. What is that? What does that mean? It means countries that issue a currency that is their own currency. The US issues the dollar, uh, the Japanese government issues the yen, the British government issues the pound. These are governments that issue their own unique currency. They receive payments in that same currency. They tax in that currency. They never need to borrow their own currency from anyone in order to be able to spend it. If they do choose to sell bonds, this thing we call government borrowing, then that is an optional thing. And they can also um, determine the interest rate that they are willing to pay on any bonds that they choose to issue. Um, what it means is that you know a few things follow from that. One, the government can never run out of money. You can't run out of the thing that you and only you have the legal authority to create, to issue. So the US government's never gonna run out of dollars. And that's not what Barack Obama told us when he was president and he had just taken office and he was asked in an interview, you know, the wheels were coming off the economy. We had the financial crisis and the great recession. And he was asked in an interview, at what point does the government run out of money? And his response was, well, we're out of money now. And it wasn't the case, and it can't be the case. And we drew so many wrong lessons from the experience of you know, 2010, watching many countries in Europe um, get very much you know, embroiled in a debt crisis. Countries like Greece, people might remember uh, having debts come due that they weren't able to pay. And many people said, listen, if the US isn't careful, we're next. We're going to end up like Greece. No wrong. Greece got into trouble, Spain got into trouble, Italy got into trouble, and, and in other uh, European countries because they were borrowing in a currency that they don't issue. Greece gave up the drachma in order to join economic and monetary union and began using the euro. So we want to pay a, a very close attention to the nature of the monetary system because that has important implications for how much policy space is available to governments. And then we can begin to talk about how governments can manage their budgets, can use their spending capacity in ways that reflect the fact that they're currency issuers. Whereas countries that aren't currency issuers like Greece and others, they have to manage their budgets differently. And so we hear these household analogies, right? That the government should balance its budget just like you and I, just, just like a household. That's not right, not for a currency issuing government like Japan or the US or the UK or Australia or many others. But it is closer to true when you're talking about countries that borrow in foreign currencies, um, that don't have what, what I've described as a sovereign currency. So that's a starting point. You can afford, these governments can afford to buy whatever is both available and for sale in their own unique currency. So when you say, what can the US government afford to do? It can afford to hire, to purchase whatever's available and for sale in US dollars. And it turns out that's a lot. And importantly, it includes all unemployed labor which means that MMT teaches us that unemployment is always a policy choice because it can easily be eliminated. So if the United States is not going to run out of money, if we can create more money to solve a lot of these problems, then you know, why are we paying taxes? What is, what is the purpose of taxes? 
Well, there are lots of reasons. So there's like, you know, an origin story. And we could talk about if you wanted to start up a currency from scratch, a tax or something that works like a tax, fees, fines, other obligations. These are ways that governments historically have introduced a currency to a population to start up a currency from scratch. So very quick brush of history here, right? You could imagine uh, in the case of, of uh, Britain, Great, Great Britain, for example, you know, uh, countries were colonized. These are colonizing countries. Uh, you go in and you say, sail over to Africa and you land and you look around and you find a lot of things that you'd like to have that you don't have access to back at home. And you think, wow, how can I get these people to give me their real you know, resources that I'm after? There are a number of ways you could go about it, some very unpleasant. Uh, one way to do it that masks some of the unpleasantries is to impose a tax. And so you say to the population, listen, you are now the subject of the crown. Ooh, what does that mean? Well, that means that periodically somebody's going to come around and they're going to collect a tax. And so what we're going to be looking for is for you to settle your obligation to the crown. Well, what's, how do I settle the tax? Oh, well, you're going to need some British currency and that's what you'll use to settle this. But I don't have British currency. Aha, we can help, right? All you have to do is produce some of the things that we're after, sell them to us. We'll buy them, provide you with the currency that you need to settle your obligation to the state. Now the people have a need for the currency. Why? Because if you don't settle the tax obligation, if you don't pay your tax, they will burn your hut down. They will, right? There's a punishment. So in other words, the tax is a way through enforcement, right? Making and enforcing tax laws to give value to a currency that would otherwise have no value to those people. And so that's an origin story. But once a, once a monetary system is up and running, like we have in the US today, then we don't think about the tax as playing that role. Even though it's still important, we think about tax as a way for the government to um, impact the distribution of wealth and income. We see that now with this $1.9 trillion uh, COVID relief package that includes tax cuts and tax effectively rebates. And, uh, and so it is a way to funnel, right, cash into people's hands. It can also be a way to take cash away from people. You could push taxes up on higher income individuals and say, well, I'm doing this because I want to kind of rebalance the distribution of wealth and income. Also, every dollar that is taxed away from us is a dollar that we don't have and can't therefore spend chasing after goods and services in the economy. So taxes are like a release valve, right? They relieve some pressure by removing dollars from our hands. The government can then spend dollars into the economy maintaining the value of the currency without creating an inflation problem. So they can add with their spending and subtract dollars by taxing and calibrate the spending and taxing so that they are managing inflationary pressures. So when you think about taxing, that's the, you know, the government raises revenue, right, through taxing, and they spend on all kinds of federal programs, things like that. And every year when the government spends more than it takes in, it creates a deficit. So, so what actually happens when, when the federal government uh, spends more in a given year than, than it brings back in? Well, a lot of things happen. The most important and straightforward of which is that somebody ends up with that currency. Somebody ends up with the money. So if, you know, the deficit is just, just this misunderstood concept. It has, it carries this connotation because the word itself is kind of inherently suggests that there's a problem. A deficit means a shortfall. Um, it, 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 people immediately think deficit bad, surplus good, right? But when the government is running a fiscal deficit, it simply means that they are spending more dollars into the economy than they are subtracting back out, mostly through taxation. So another way to refer to deficit spending is to call it net spending, right? Because if the government spends 100 in and only taxes 90 out, we call that a deficit. But it masks what's happening on the other side. If they put 100 in and only take 90 out, somebody's getting 10. So on the other side of every government deficit lies a financial surplus equal and opposite in size, right? Their red ink is our black ink. Their deficits are our financial surpluses, which is why every deficit is good for someone. 
the question is always for whom and for what, right? This $1.9 trillion COVID relief package that just made it through the Senate and will in all likelihood go to the president's desk and become uh, law. This $1.9 trillion COVID relief package is putting money into the hands of healthcare providers to help roll out vaccines. It's putting $350 billion in for state and local governments to help shore up budgets there and prevent further job losses. It's sending $1,400 checks to most Americans. It's providing unemployment uh, insurance support for people who are still unemployed and so forth and so on, right? that money is going into the hands of people who are really hurting in this economy. Counter that with the $1.9 trillion tax cuts the Republicans passed in December of 2017. These were both pieces of legislation that cost $1.9 trillion, but the Republicans used the deficit to funnel a financial windfall, mostly to people who are already doing really well in this economy. So both 1.9 trillion packages produce financial surpluses on the other side, but they went to very different groups of people in, in our economy. And so every deficit's good for someone, question is for whom, and for what purpose is the deficit being used? Are we doing infrastructure and education and healthcare and COVID relief, or are we doing you know, tax breaks for corporations and people who, frankly, are already doing phenomenally well uh, in this economy. So, yeah, I mean, when you think about taxes as a way to redistribute wealth and you look at America's, you know, income and wealth inequality has grown so much over the last century, it really makes you realize that we've really messed up the taxation in this country because it's doing the exact opposite thing that it's uh, that it's supposed to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, we got sold a bill of goods, right, for our, for 40 plus years, really, um, with this supply side and trickle down and this idea that, you know, the real job creators in the economy are the people at the very top and that you have to do everything you can to tickle their bellies and incentivize them and, and treat them very, very gently and kindly. And if you do all the right things, then they will rain down jobs and benefits to everybody else. And, you know, we have done this, we have run this experiment time after time after time, Reagan, Thatcher, all across the world. This isn't unique to the US, right? This supply side idea that tax cuts for the rich have um, trickle down effects and that you end up, you know, lifting everyone from the bottom. The, the evidence is in. It, it does not work. And there are recent studies out, a big one actually, from I think a couple of economists at the uh, London School of Economics, if I'm not mistaken. And they have done a, a very interesting study looking at the past 40 years, 18 countries that have pursued supply side trickle down tax cut uh, kind of policies. And what they concluded is it's a colossal failure that in every instance, it has not produced the benefits that it purported to produce. And I, I think that most of the people who pushed um, this sort of supply side stuff knew all along that it doesn't generate those benefits, but it was a marketing, you know, it's like, you know, the narrative was we do this for the job creators and it benefits everyone. And for, for many years and across many nations, governments voted for these kinds of policies. And you're right. What they did was widen the inequities and not deliver uh, the broader based benefits that were promised. Yeah, so much of this, uh, after reading the book, it does feel like a you know, marketing campaign to you know, not only redistribute wealth, but to limit that government spending and using this idea that we should all be worried about a growing national debt. Um, as the as a rationale for for not spending on things that clearly our society needs. So, um, why shouldn't we listen to anyone that's telling us to to be afraid uh, about the the current size or increasing the, the America's national debt? Okay, so now we're shifting to the the debt, right? Because you know, and you're right. You know, these uh, these people who push tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts as always and everywhere, the right policy move, no matter what the situation is, tax cuts are the, are the solution, right? Whatever problem we face, cut taxes. 
uh, and that will fix things. And so we do this, Republicans do this, in particular conservative governments tend to do this, and then you get an increase in the deficit because the tax cuts don't deliver the growth that then delivers higher revenues that then make the tax cuts pay for themselves, as they like to say. So what you're left with are larger deficits that increase the national debt. And then Republicans will turn around when they're no longer in office and say to Democrats, you can't spend any money now because look at that huge debt, right? And then Democrats say, oh my God, usually you're right. You know, they'll say something like, you're right. We have this huge fiscal crisis, uh, but you did it, right? So then it becomes uh, uh, the blame game is over who caused the problem. And so what I try to do in the book is to just you know, fundamentally question the premise. Is there really a problem? Are we facing a long-term fiscal uh, problem? And my answer is no, that there is not evidence that we here in the US or uh, many other major countries that have long believed that they face a looming fiscal crisis. That's just simply not true. And, you know, both Democrats and Republicans for the most part accept the premise. They say we have a long-term fiscal crisis and they disagree about what to do about it and who caused it, right? There's a lot of finger pointing and, and a, the blame game. Uh, and then they point to different culprits. So for example, you know, if your listeners are interested, I, uh, I would suggest Googling, um, uh, you can Google the name Jason Furman, or even Janet Yellen, because they both signed their names to an op-ed just a few years ago, two and a half, three years ago, maybe. Uh, it, the op-ed ran in the Washington Post, and the op-ed was titled, A Debt Crisis is Coming, But Don't Blame Entitlements. In other words, don't blame Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid, uh, but a debt crisis is coming. And they, this was a, an op-ed signed on to by five former heads of the Council of Economic Advisors, the President's Council of Economic Advisors, including Janet Yellen, right? The current Treasury Secretary, former Fed Chair, uh, and other Obama advisors and so forth. So five of them put their name on this thing. There, a debt crisis is coming, but don't you Republicans blame entitlements. They're only part of the problem. And they were writing in response to an op-ed also published in the Washington Post written by five conservative, uh, I believe all economists um, from the Hoover Institution. And the five conservatives from Hoover said, a debt crisis is coming, it's mainly entitlements and we have to cut social security and Medicare to fix the problem. So what I'm saying is that for a very, very long time, economists on the left and the right, Democrats, Republicans, we call them fiscal hawks, the conservatives and fiscal doves, the Democrats, they have all agreed that, yes, we're in trouble, we're in trouble, but they disagree over how we got in trouble and what to do about it. And Democrats say mostly we don't tax enough and you guys start too many wars and don't pay for them. So this is how the disagreement goes. So to your question now, you know, how do I deal with this in the book? I look at the national debt so-called very differently. And in fact, I titled the chapter, uh, the national debt and in parentheses, that isn't. It's a national debt that isn't. So what is this thing that we refer to as the national debt that we talk about as uh, representing a real burden on our futures? This is the thing we're leaving to our children and our grandchildren. This is what they inherit. This is what's gonna make their lives harder uh, and, and less prosperous in the future because we've handed them these, sh these shackles and now they're responsible for paying off this debt. So I don't look at it like that at all. Here's how I look at it. Um, the government, as I said before, chooses, chooses to sell government bonds, securities known as US treasuries in this country. Some are short term, some are longer term. Government treasury sells these things. How do they sell them and why? what happens when they do that? So the government is matching its deficit spending by offering US Treasury. So whenever the government's budget is in deficit, an equivalent amount of government debt bonds are sold. So let's do the numbers. The government spends $100 into the economy. It only taxes $90 back out. It has run a deficit. 
place $10 in the system. As it runs a deficit, it sells government bonds. So now it's got 10 government bonds and it says, who wants to buy these? Okay, and what happens? $10 comes back out of the economy and 10 treasuries go in. What is a US treasury? It's an interest bearing dollar. It's an interest bearing dollar. I took out a currency. I took out a non-interest bearing dollar. I replaced it with an interest bearing dollar. I didn't have to do it. And the person who got it is pretty lucky because they have a risk-free asset. It's a very safe risk-free government bond that pays them interest while they take no risk. It's a subsidy, right? It's a, it's a way to subsidize people who already have money. You let them give you some of their cash and you replace it with interest bearing cash. It's a pretty sweet deal. The problem is that we refer to the outstanding stock of US treasuries as the national debt, instead of calling it part of the US money supply or US wealth and savings, right? Those treasuries are part of somebody's accumulated savings and wealth. They're not on the hook for that. It's not their liability, it's their asset. So, uh, you know, we don't have a debt problem. We don't have a deficit problem. We have a communications problem. And, and it's just the, the language that we choose to use, government borrowing, debt, those are words that are appropriate if we're talking about a household budget, but they're inapplicable once we move to the currency issuer and start talking about what, what is happening at that level. So then what should policymakers be thinking about when they're deciding, you know, how much money to put into the economy this year? Is there something that they should be concerned about? If not the debt, uh, something else that could, that should constrain how much we spend? Well, look, I mean, I wouldn't ask, I wouldn't approach the question in terms of how much money should we put into the economy. I try to say, you know, in the book, I say the goal is not to achieve any particular budget balance. The goal is to achieve a healthy, balanced economy. So what does that look like? So, you know, I want to, I have a chapter in the book, chapter seven is called the deficits that matter. So in that chapter, I talk about climate, I talk about infrastructure, I talk about education and healthcare and other you know, uh, shortfalls, deficiencies, the real deficits in our economy. And the way that I would approach the budgeting process is to identify those deficits, right? To figure out what problems are we trying to solve and how do we fit the budget to the problem. So if we're trying to deal with climate change, if we're trying to deal with, you know, uh, infrastructure that is poorly managed and outdated and, and so forth, how much would we need to invest to bring our infrastructure grade up from a C or whatever it currently is, C plus to let's say a B plus or an A minus over time. This COVID relief package, I'll keep coming back to it because it serves as a good example in so many ways. The COVID relief package is going to lift half of all the kids who today are in poverty will be lifted out of poverty as a result of some of the things that are being done in that COVID relief package, right? If we can lift half of the kids out of poverty, what about the other half? Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. for me, it's about you know figuring out what problems you wanna solve and then fitting the budget to address those problems. And there's not a right number out there lurking. What there is, is, uh, you know, a limited um, array of resources that you can tap to solve real problems. If you want to make public colleges and universities tuition free for everybody in this country, what you need are enough faculty, right? You need graduate students, you need structures so that people can sit in classrooms and get to universities and colleges and so forth. So you need to be able to deliver on that promise in real terms. And so the question is, how do you resource that, right? And, and that's how I think about the federal budgeting process. The dollars are the easy part to figure out. Managing inflationary pressures and working within the constraints that you face because resources aren't aren't infinite, they're finite. And you do have to budget your priorities and you do have to make choices. So, you know, it's about prioritizing. Budgets are moral documents, but they also force us to prioritize and to make choices. You mentioned man managing inflationary pressures. 
How do we know when we're we're approaching too high inflation levels? Well, we don't necessarily know. Um, we can take the economy's temperature in different ways. Look, I, I don't think that anybody is talking about sitting down and starting from scratch, from zero. Imagine building out a $5 trillion federal government budget. So much of the federal government's budget is locked in place, right? It is mandatory spending, non-discretionary. The vast majority of the dollars that the federal government spends on an annual basis, you can't play with their social security, their Medicare, right? Their um, interest payments on the so-called national debt and so forth. The discretionary budget's pretty small. So when we talk about making changes to spending, you know, discretionary, more spending on infrastructure, education, healthcare, that sort of thing. Then I think actually it gets easier to answer your question about you know, the marginal dollar, the next dollar spent. Are we at greater risk of inflation accelerating if we put another you know, 50 billion in Pell Grants? That's probably a very straightforward and, and safe calculation, right? But if we were to move to if we were to do $4 trillion uh, infrastructure climate package, would that uh, invite greater inflationary pressures? And then you have to really drill down, right? You have to say, well, what is it we're gonna try to do with that infrastructure climate package? Oh, we're gonna try to build high-speed rail and we're gonna do solar and we're gonna do broadband and we're gonna do energy, you know, da, da, da. And then you have to start going deeper and deeper and deeper to say, what are the resource needs to do that high-speed rail? And how quickly do you wanna build it? And what about the broadband and how quickly? And then you say, do we have companies that are uh, you know, equipped to supply us with cranes and concrete trucks and machines and the things we need. Or if I pick up the phone and call Caterpillar and I say, could you fill an order for these things? If I were to place an order, do we have the steel? Do we have the machines? They said, no, I have a huge backlog. I couldn't get to that for another year at best. That tells you right then that if you were to try to do that much spending, the capacity constraint is binding that, you know, the, the resource capacity. Oh, um, I think you have to evaluate proposed new spending on you know, a case-by-case -case basis, and you have to look very closely at what it is you're proposing to spend over how long a period of time, and then get a sense of whether um, industries have capacity to meet those orders, whether you have enough unemployed construction workers, architects, engineers, can you mobilize the real resources that you would need to, you know, achieve what it is you're you're trying to achieve and if not you have to make choices right you can always wrestle the resources away from the private sector if if there's you know construction workers are being used to build residential housing for example and you don't have the people that you would need for a large scale climate infrastructure program you could choose hey climate is is a priority and we're going to take workers away we'll bid them away you can do that, right? Now that's going to create some inflationary pressures. And at that point, it, it becomes a decision about, you know, how much inflation do you think that would likely um, create in additional inflationary pressure? And do you think it's worth it for the sake of getting those resources to, you know, away from building whatever it is they're currently building to doing climate and related We've talked a lot about fiscal policy to this point, but there's a flip side that there's a monetary policy. And we know that, you know, the way that the Fed reigns in inflation or forecasted inflation is by increasing interest rates. And when you have higher in interest rates, um, businesses aren't able to borrow as much and they aren't able to spend as much. And we also know that you know, we need this mix of private and public investment in new climate solutions, but you argue in the deficit myth that government, you know, government spending, government deficits will not lead to a decrease in private investment. So, can you explain why that why that is? Well, I don't rule out the possibility. In fact, I just gave you an example of how government spending could crowd out, elbow out some uh, private sector endeavors. And I was giving you an example of how it could be done quite deliberately. Uh, but this question about interest rates. So, you know, um, 
the usual argument in economics and one that I att attempt to debunk in that chapter that you're referring to is the idea that when the government runs a deficit, it has to go out and find the money to cover the shortfall. So it goes to savers and they've got dollars and the government says, I want some of those dollars because I need to finance my deficit. And the textbook story is that now there are fewer dollars left and available to the private sector for their endeavors. So as you said, businesses, when the supply of available funds shrinks, then the cost of those funds goes up. So the government deficit is driving the interest rate up. And you're saying, well, if interest rates go up, then businesses can't afford to borrow. And so some private investment doesn't get undertaken. And that could, and that's what economists refer to as crowding out, that the government's deficit crowds out private sector spending and leads to slower growth over time because the private sector is assumed to be more efficient and their investments would have uh, you know, enhanced productivity and growth, whereas government spending, eh, less efficient, all that stuff. So, but in the book, I say, listen, what about the possibility that instead of crowding out private sector investments, government deficits actually crowd in private sector spending and investment? Sure, that happens. Think about it. So when government is running a deficit and putting income into people's hands, and we're seeing it again, I'll come back to the COVID relief package, $1,400 going to almost every uh, person in this country, right? Uh, and, and the other uh, money as well. What are people going to do? Well, a lot of people are going to turn around and spend dollars, those dollars back into the economy. And what happens? Now you've created demand. Now you're a customer for some business. What do businesses do when they're swamped with customers? They hire more people, right? You don't fire the bus boy if the line uh, to get in your restaurant is wrapped around the building. And so businesses will hire and invest when they're swamped with customers. And so it's easy to, I think, to see and understand how government spending puts income into our hands that then allows us to be good consumers, right? To have robust consumption that then encourages businesses because they see their sales and their revenues and their profits going up to say, I got to invest in some new equipment. I got to hire uh, some additional workers, right? And so that's what I mean by, by crowding in. But it's not that only crowding in is possible. It's just that the usual narrative about deficits are bad because they push up interest rates and rising interest rates leads to less investment and less investment leads to lower growth. That I think is very wrong. So when I read that, or when I read the deficit myth and, and I talk to you now, this all seems perfectly clear. Like this is the, you know, you talk about the moment of, you know, clarity. Uh, that people have when this kind of clicks and, and it's clicked with me because you've explained it so well, but why do you think, I mean, we, we just don't hear it talked about this way by politicians and, and definitely not in the media. Um, why do you think it is, it continues to be framed as the national debt is a, is a problem for, for the, for America? Well, listen, it, it, I had a colleague back at my previous university. His name's Bill Black. He's a law and economics professor. And Bill used to, used to refer to these things as uh, career limiting gestures. He would talk about, Bill was a white collar criminologist. Okay, so he went after uh, and prosecuted white collar crime. Uh, and there are certain things that when you do them or say them, uh, they do limit your career potential. And so he called, he coined this phrase, career limiting gestures. Uh, you know, it is very hard to take a narrative that is a significant departure from the norm. And, you know, you're sticking your neck out. You're going against the mainstream orthodox views on these things. You're rebutting people with very fancy degrees from very fancy universities, sometimes Nobel prizes and so forth. And then what? You're gonna stand up and make the counter argument that we shouldn't be hysterical about the long-term trajectory of the debt to GDP ratio or something. And you wanna try to soothe and calm and people will point to all the expertise and say, oh, so they're all wrong. Right? Are oh, they're all wrong? Well, there aren't a lot of people in, you know, journalists or other academics who I think are prepared to risk 
it's a career limiting gesture. You know, you you are risking uh, to some extent your credibility in the eyes of those who decide who's credible and who isn't. So um, it's a it's getting easier. I will say it's getting easier. And I think part of the reason it's getting easier is because all of the chicken littles, remember the fiscal hawks and the fiscal doves have been telling us for decades that a debt crisis is coming. A debt crisis, I just referred to the Washington Post piece. All these top economists all saying a debt crisis is coming. They said it 10 years ago, they said it five years ago, they said it three years ago, they said it 20 years ago, and it never happens. And at some point, the credibility, I think theirs begins to uh, be compromised because why do you keep telling us that all these terrible things are gonna happen because of deficits and debt, they don't happen. And now we're watching you folks in real time change your own stories to try to fit the the empirics which are that interest rates have gone down not up as deficits exploded and the debt went up you know all the stuff that you warned about high inflation and so forth it it just the reality is the opposite has happened in almost every case so you're seeing a lot of people softly uh, soften their own narrative right they're trying to figure out how to distance themselves from their prior um, statements about this stuff. And, and I think we're getting, we're making progress. Definitely some progress, but then you go back and listen to, you know, the media commentator, media commentators on this COVID stimulus bill, uh, this $1.9 trillion COVID stimulus bill. A lot of people are complaining about how this is going to increase, further increase the national debt. Um, and I think we're going to continue to hear this or, or, even worse, as President Biden puts forward his, you know, multi-trillion dollar climate bill, are you concerned that Democrats, not Republicans, Democrats are going to give in to fears about further increasing the, the debt and not vote for an appropriately sized climate bill? And, and if so, how do we convince them otherwise? You bet I'm concerned. <laughs> I'm deeply concerned. We got 50, uh, 50 votes in the Senate uh, and you can't lose a single one. And, um, you know, yeah, I'm concerned. I saw a, a comment just this morning, I guess Senator Manchin did an interview, I think with uh, like Axios H HBO or something like that. And he said, he's very excited about what comes next after the COVID relief comes the next big package. He said, oh, I'm super excited about it. Uh, I've been wanting to do infrastructure for a long time. I think that, you know, I'm, I don't wanna get rid of the filibuster. I think we can get 60 votes on this stuff. I think we can probably get 4 trillion, 4 trillion, uh, but we gotta pay for it all. We, 100% of it, we can, we can pay for. Now, <laughs> it doesn't pass the laugh test. It just doesn't. The, the reality is, I'm sorry, but you're never going to get 60 votes. That means 10 Republicans would have to, if all the Democrats voted for it, you'd need 10 Republicans. And you're going to propose um, 4 trillion or so in spending on infrastructure and infrastructure related investments. And you want to fully offset it with new revenue. You find me 10 Republicans who are going to vote for all those tax increases. They don't exist. And by the way, I don't think that you can find 50 Democrats who sure. will vote for the tax increases to fully offset 4 trillion. So am I worried? Yes, I'm I'm quite worried. How do we get them to pass something? Well, you ain't going to get there with 60 votes. That's not a reality. So you're going to do it if it's going to be done at all through reconciliation, which is the same process that was just used to move the COVID relief 1.9 trillion. You use exactly the same uh, process, budget reconciliation. Um, you can do it without offsetting all the spending, which means you, you could just commit the spending. You could offset some of it, maybe none of it. Uh, we didn't offset anything from March of last year to March of this year. Congress has just been doing multi-trillion dollar spending packages, no offsets, no quote unquote pay fors, no new taxes. Um, <clears throat> how much more of that would they be willing to do? 
And you know, you just asked the million dollar or trillion dollar question, right? Which is, um, how do you get Congress to vote to pass these things if some people are starting to find their fiscal um, hawkish, their inner fiscal hawk is coming out, right? And you know, I hear Democrats. I've heard uh, House members say at some point you have to start paying for your spending. You can't keep and. This is what MMT is all about. MMT is all about helping us to ask and answer the question, you know, whether and when and how to offset spending. Because as long as there's some low hanging fruit left and low hanging fruit means the government can safely spend into the economy without offsetting that spending by higher taxes or cuts to some other part of the budget. You can just spend the dollars. And the word safely is important, right? Because the low hanging fruit means that there's fiscal space. It means that there is enough room in the budget to allow you, not in the budget, I shouldn't say it like that. It means that there is enough slack in the economy that you can spend money in without creating inflationary problems. So at some point, that fiscal space starts to diminish, and you have to know when you're running out of low-hanging fruit. And that's when the offsets become important. But my God, why pick an unnecessary fight? You know, if there's some low-hanging fruit and you can come in on the back of this relief package and get a re recovery package in place where you, you know, you can commit the spending without picking the secondary fight, which is the tax fight, that's gonna make it 10 times harder to collect the votes you need to pass the legislation, then, you know, why do that? You saw this firsthand, both as chief economist for the Democrats in the, in the Senate Budget Committee, but also as you were serving as Senator Bernie Sanders' economic advisor during his 2020 presidential run. Um, obviously, Senator Sanders is, is you know, huge progressive and proponent of uh, government spending to make the lives of Americans so much better. But you note in the book that even he gets the deficit problem wrong when he tries to fund these programs by raising taxes. I mean, that's, that's been a big part of his messaging. D did you see his thinking shift, though, on this um, over your time, you know, with him, working with him? Well, not over my, well, look, uh, it, it has shifted. I think that the evidence that it is, that it has shifted is that he is now the chairman of the budget committee. I was once the chief economist for the Democrats on the U.S. Uh, Senate Budget Committee, and he hired me for that position. And you're right. In the book, I write about some of what uh, you know I witnessed in 2015, 16, and then on the presidential campaigns. Where let's be, you know, let's recognize that every Democratic candidate tried to pay for their entire agenda. There was enormous pressure to lay out a blueprint to say, you wanted a, you want to do all of these things? These are your policy proposals? Show me how you're going to pay for it. The press would not have tolerated yeah. anything less. So that was the game, and everybody attempted to play it. Now, however, uh, he is chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, and he just helped to usher through the reconciliation process, this $1.9 trillion package with no offsets. So, you know, he didn't hold it up saying, wait a minute, the deficit, we have to offset the spending, we must pay for our things. No, he didn't do that, right? It's, so we're in a very different place today compared to the way that, and, and that's true of House Democrats as well. Uh, a lot has changed. I think the Trump tax cuts helped. Uh, and when I say helped, I mean helped shift Democrats' own thinking. You know, I used to, uh, I can remember going into more than one meeting with members of Congress uh, in just the last 
two years and sitting down and saying, you know, just kind of poking fun and saying, are you yet tired of playing Charlie Brown to Lucy in the football? Yeah. I mean, every time they run the same play, they get the Republicans get the House and the Senate and, and the White House and the deficit concerns are out the window. They pass their agenda. If it adds to the deficit, so be it. They are laser focused on passing their agenda. Democrats come in and say, oh, we're the uh, fiscally responsible party. We hold ourselves to a different and we think higher standard. We pay for our priorities. And then whoop, Lucy and the football, Lucy, and, you know, and, and so I kind of tease them a little bit and say, are we, are, is we learning, you know, are we, are we figuring this stuff out? Uh, and the good news is that they are. And that's so much of the thinking uh, inside staffers and members of Congress. It's, it has changed. COVID helped change it a lot more. Good. Well, Senator Sanders, obviously a supporter of the Green New Deal, and the Green New Deal calls for a federal jobs guarantee, which I was really happy to see in, in your book that so does MMT. So how would a federal jobs guarantee work? And, and what are some of the, uh, the potential environmental benefits? Yeah, so a, a federal job guarantee is what it sounds like, right? It is the federal government guaranteeing that anybody who wants to work but can't find a job anywhere else in the economy can always be assured a job, right? At a basic wage and benefit package. So a living, think of a living wage and benefit package. Um, and so it is a standing job offer. People hear about healthcare, we hear about sometimes a, a public option in healthcare. This is like a public option in the labor market. Right? It's available to everyone. It doesn't go away. It's a standing offer. If for any reason uh, you should want to be in that program, you can be in that program. Maybe you have an employer who constantly messes with your hours. You don't know from one day to the next you know, what days you're supposed to show up for work and what times and you're trying to arrange childcare and it's just a nightmare and you're making minimum wage or whatever. And you say, I've had, maybe I'm being harassed at work. Maybe, you know, for any reason you want into that program, you have a job in that program. Federally funded, locally administered. So you ask about uh, how it relates to climate. What we imagine is that the jobs are oriented broadly around uh, building a care economy. So you're caring for people, caring for planet, caring for your community. In one way or another, all of the jobs should um, be oriented to do one of, you know, contribute in one of those three ways. So, you know, your imagination is kind of the limit. I write some about this in the book. I co-authored a, a report a few years ago for the Levy Economics Institute. Uh, I think it was called um, Guaranteed Employment, a Pathway to Full Employment. There are five or so of us uh, authoring that. We get into a lot of detail there about the kinds of jobs. Uh, and another MMT economist named Pavlina Chernova has a book that came out around the same time as my book. Uh, hers is called The Case for a Federal Job Guarantee. So I just want to point those out because people who want more than I can do in a short time here might find it interesting. But, you know, the communities themselves, they decide on the kinds of jobs that they want performed, um, you know. You, you think about, Pavlina will sometimes talk about uh, invasive species and, you know, if some people could be responsible for monitoring invasive species and why is that of benefit? Well, because farmers' crops feed the rest of us and if they are struggling uh, with invasive species and that sort of thing, climate, you know, tree planting, we, we can think of of a million and one different things that people might propose that are valuable, that would be valuable to the community, that help us shore up uh, coastal lines, clean up environmental cleanup, um, community gardens, you can have neighborhood beautification projects, and the really the sky is, is sort of the limit. Performing uh, the arts, you know, when FDR was president, and he uh, had a huge unemployment problem on his hands. And he came up with a similar idea. And he said, we should just directly put people to work. We should employ them. And so we got an alphabet soup of jobs programs. We got the Works Progress Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the National Youth Administration, a jobs program for young people. Um, the CCC was mostly environmental, uh, oriented around environmental concerns. But workers in the WPA uh, 
program did everything from building and construction oriented things to uh, oral histories, recording oral histories, uh, performance art, street performances, theater, you know, I mean, it was, you can be very, very inclusive. And the idea is to take people as they are and where they are, right? And to fit the job to the person. Well, two of the, I would say, most talked about solutions to decarbonizing our electric electricity grid uh, that have been put forth are a, a federal clean energy standard and a price on carbon. Um, these solutions either you know require a reward, they either reward utilities uh, for for decarbonizing, or they require them to do it um, by by switching over from these fossil fuel burning assets to clean energy assets, right? Um, but you write in the deficit myth that both of these solutions have flaws. Clean energy standard may place a higher cost burden on ratepayers, and um, carbon price may not push utilities to act fast enough. So how does, what would the MMT approach be to a, you know, to the federal government solving this electricity decarbonization problem? Well, look, I, I'm not an environmental economist. So I, you know, I point to some things in the book, you just read a, a passage there, um, but I do try to stay in my lane. I'm not trying to offer a solution or a set of solutions that are direct pathways to getting us to where we need to be on climate. I. Uh, definitely defer to climate experts in this space. And, you know, I've done a number of talks on uh, the Green New Deal and that sort of thing, but my area of expertise is on the mechanics of the financing. So where I can be helpful, I think, is in reminding folks that it's about our real resources, that if we have the technological know-how and we have the real resources, the money can always be made available. And I think, you know, time is of the essence. And so where so often we want to go slower than we need to go, proceed at a slower pace, more incremental and so forth, is because of the budgetary concerns. And so again, you know, I, where my area of expertise can be helpful in pushing us to where I hope we will go is with a bold, ambitious action plan to you know, uh, hold carbon emissions, to keep us within our carbon budget, to uh, do the sort of things that climate experts tell us we need to do. Uh, and I can help you know, lay out the, the economic argument for why we can afford to move much more quickly, that it's the, the real challenge is managing the inflationary pressures. Yeah, you mentioned the carbon budget. I mean, we have real natural constraints. I mean, the carbon budget, um, the amount of natural resources that we can extract before, you know, they no longer are able to regenerate themselves. Do you think that there's a responsibility among other economists to recommend policy that, that reflects these real natural constraints and talk in these terms? Yes. And fortunately, there are many good ones out there. I mean, you know, Kate Raworth, uh, Mariana Matsukato, both uh, friends of mine, Kate uh, with, um, you know, the Donut Economics is a book that is, I think, had a tremendous impact and influences policymaking uh, around the world. You know, you've got cities and nations committing to trying to you know, operate within the safe part of what she calls the donut, right? Not pushing beyond the boundaries and also not uh, doing things that would so deprive you of a good life, but to keep you in that, in that safe place. Mariana with her, you know, mission economy and the entrepreneurial state, um, Naomi Klein, Steve Keen. I mean, no, Naomi's not an economist, obviously, but you know, has uh, done a lot of work here as an academic as well. Steve Keen, an economist who has really taken apart the Nordhaus uh, Nobel Prize winning economist's work on uh, climate and, and so forth. And, and Steve does great work and there are so many others. And yes, it's incumbent upon us because for better or worse, and it's usually, I'm afraid to say for worse, economists have an outsized voice in the public debates. They do. You know, you will listen to a president. They don't often stand up and say, well, leading sociologists tell us or leading anthropologists say. It's always what economists are telling us. You know, economists are saying, so we enjoy um, this 
you know, status of somehow being the ones who are supposed to know and provide, you know, the proper guidance to policymakers and so forth. So yeah, it's it's important for economists to to do the work, to step up, to help push policy thinking in that ambitious direction to, to allow leaders to see that you know things are achievable because so much of what they're presented with from economists is what you can't do. It's why you can't do things. It's you know the cost benefit analysis say no, or the CBO report says no, or this says no, and you need people who are um, willing and able to step forward and push back against those dominant um, themes that, well, interest rates are going to prevent it or markets will prevent it or investors won't allow it or something. You gotta be able to demonstrate why those arguments are, are flawed. We talked earlier about America being one of the few countries that has monetary sovereignty. So does that give us, you think that gives us an advantage when it comes to really uh, being leaders on the global scale or on the, on the global stage for climate policy? Well, of course it does, but the U.S. is not one of, I wouldn't say we're one of a few. Um, you know, I mentioned Australia and Canada, New Zealand, the U.K., Japan. I mean, there are a lot of countries, actually, and we can include Europe as long as the ECB is a willing partner, because the European Central Bank is the issuer of the currency. That is where you know, if you have an ECB willing to backstop in a sense, to, to coordinate with and to allow the 19 countries that compromise their sovereignty by giving up their currencies and, and adopting the Euro, if the ECB will, um, will work as a partner with those 19 countries, then you can include, you know, Europe uh, as part of that. And, and, you know, it's most of the the industrialized wealthy world. And yes, they have uh, an important role to play and they need to step up and um, and shoulder that sh their share of this burden going forward. Well, uh, the deficit myth really opened my eyes to what is possible and it really forced me to to not only question what I what I thought I knew about how our our economy works, but also just reframe how I think about fiscal policy overall. And I I cannot recommend this book anymore. I mean, so if you're listening to this, please go out and get the Deficit Myth. It's available now in paperback, and it really is an incredibly important book to read and understand, and, and really use it as a tool uh, in crafting a more sustainable and just future. So Dr. Kelton, is, is there anywhere else that our listeners can follow your work online or on social media? Well, I'm on Twitter. Uh, that's about the only social media platform I understand. And so it's the one I use. Um, and I, I tweet under the um, name just at Stephanie Kelton. Um, I, I will write periodically for the New York Times and outlets like that. I've got a piece coming out soon with the Times. Um, but the Twitter feed is where I would share appearances and anything I write. So. Well, it is a fantastic book. Dr. Stephanie Kelton, thank you again for joining the Climate Pod. Thank you so much for having me.